The book, the book. Give me the book, bring the book. Well, my uh, library in my office has all my Midwestern Baptist College stuff, you know, the Greek, the Hebrew, and all that. And I thought I'd bring my Greek New Testament out. Amen. They even put like a vinyl cover so it would be like waterproof to protect me. And uh, this, I believe, is the uh, 26th edition. And uh, as far as uh, with the uh, italics and not the italics, but with the uh, uh, punctuation and all that from Stephanus, you'll see that it's a list of uh, people that contributed to uh, the King James Bible. But this is the underlying text that uh, Origen, Tischendorf, Westcott, and Hort use. This is what I was taught in school. And what I wanted you to see out of it, because I don't expect you to read Greek, slowly. Yeah, I don't want to look at it. But anyway, what I'll show you is they give you a legend, you know, a thing that explains what the uh, what the caricatures on the bottom of the testament are no problems with it amen unless you talk to somebody it's always these arguments let me go through latin before the greek there's a good latin there's a bad latin and enter erasmus this is where the, the text comes in and this uh, covers him, his parents, you know, being Catholic or whatever. And you had a Catholic that made his Greek uh, manuscripts uh, and collated them and got them all together. And that's what your King James follows. You know, well, they answer that here. Just like King James was a queer. That's, I got a whole book against that, that anybody can read it and uh, they could take them to court on evidence of libel. That's uh, today's Christianity magazine and some others that even suggested that because uh, you know, see I'm getting fragmented I'm getting off but anyway King James was sickly he had a stenographer and everything lay in the bed with him taking notes and the guy that spent the, uh, spread the rumor was a guy they got rid of that was uh, Catholic he, he, he sent out everybody got rid of all the Catholics didn't trust them and then he had the conspiracy the black powder conspiracy the guy with the mask Anyway, I showed you that. I'd have to go over everything again and try to really, really go in depth and explain it. But uh, Dr. Ruckman's school does teach the Greek, does teach the Hebrew, and it's not to correct the King James, but it's to answer questions about the King James, how we got it, where it came from, the manuscripts that were used, and uh, so they can actually keep up with people that uh, have this... Uh, uh, in kind of intelligence towards the Word of God being that the originals are the only thing inspired and preserved and you need them to check everything else out. Right. Latin before Greek and this is before 1516 AD there was no Greek New Testament that you could pick up and hold in your hand. There was no book into which were bound the uh, uh, 27 uh, books of the New Testament. Uh, this is hard to imagine since there was already an entire Bible in print at the time. Uh, Johann or Johann Gutenberg invented the movable type and in 1456 had produced the world's first printed book, the Bible. So we see we're talking about the Latin 1516. We're talking about there was a little, uh, complete in 1456 uh, on the Gutenberg uh, print. And yet the New Testament in Gutenberg's Bible was not translated from the Greek for there was no Greek available to him. So how in the world did uh, this condition arise? Well, here comes the good Latin. Anybody know what Roman language is? Who's ruling the earth at that time? Rome. Okay. So good Latin. 
One of the earliest translations of scripture took place in, in 157 AD, 157 AD, when the New Testament was translated into Latin. Now, this is interesting. The Greek used for this translation was what is called today the Benzentine or Antioch in Greek. Remember Antioch? First called Christian, Antioch, Syria. And that's the Benzentine Empire over there. Now it is the Greek which is found in thousands of Greek manuscripts extant today and is truest to the originals. This Latin translation swept into Europe a thousand years held sway over Christianity. It was so commonly used by the true church that it derived its very name from the Latin word for common, meaning vulgar, and was thus referred to as the Vulgate. Now, me being a Catholic, Vulgate to me was the Latin Catholic Bible. I didn't understand, I just meant, everybody said it, Vulgate, I just meant common language but I knew that that church had the Latin Bible, okay? Now we're talking about bad Latin. The Roman Catholic Church, whose lust for power and control are historically felt, or they felt the sting of this biblical authority. They needed some way to eliminate this biblical thorn in their side, but both Christians and Roman Catholics were loyal to it <laughs> because back in this day that's all they had they're speaking Latin that's what they had so you can imagine people getting actually saved being part of the Catholic Church they're getting out of there and their authority was the old Latin Bible and uh, if you remember the date 157 AD took the this <laughs> this Catholic Church in 380 AD they uh, hit upon the plan of producing their very own Latin translation and offered it as a replacement for the Vulgate. Offered it as a replacement for the Vulgate. The Greek used <laughs> for this Roman Catholic translation was not the Greek common to the New Testament church, no. The pure Greek of Antioch was the very problem they were trying to eliminate. Therefore, the Romanists had to go all the way to Egypt And, and uh, 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 out of the word there, I don't know, scare, scare, oh, scary up, a little known, uh, little used Greek text, which would serve their purposes. A Greek text so removed from the mainstream that it can be found nowhere outside of Egypt and exists today in a mere handful of well-preserved, oft-corrected, uh, seldom used manuscripts. The work was done by a loyal Roman Catholic scholar named Jerome. And in an attempt to deceive the public was officially named the Vulgate, causing confusion to this very day. But Christians were not so easily fooled and Jerome's last was avoided like the plague. Thus 900 years later, 900 years later in 1280 AD, the Roman Catholic Church found it necessary to use force to get the public to use this poor quality translation. Christians who defied Rome and held firm to the true Vulgate were persecuted ruthlessly until enough blood was spilled that the corporate will of the public was broken and Rome's Vulgate replaced the real thing. Today, the original 157 AD Latin Vulgate is referred to as the Old Latin. Most copies have been destroyed but now when anyone studying history reads that early European Christians were loyal to the Vulgate, they were misled into thinking it reference to Rome's Vulgate rather than the true Vulgate of 157. So Johann Gutenberg's Bible, coming 200 years after the good Latin, had been replaced by the bad Latin, <laughs> was based on the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's called Jerome's Latin Vulgate. But up to this time, no one had yet sought out the extant Greek manuscripts of the Antiochian text and collated them into one volume. So the text manuscripts are everywhere. And what we see is that the, the we're talking about, when you look at the chart, you'll be getting probably pretty soon, it's gonna be 
And absolutely, Jesus Christ, his word, moves to the disciples through the church. And then it goes beyond the church. But that's in the New Testament. That's in the uh, uh, Asia Minor area. We're seeing, remember, when you're reading your Bible, these are letters that were collected. But at the time, they were being written. So a lot of this stuff was going on, but it was all going on in the church. You'd never want to get away from the church. And uh, that's what God used. So you guys are not, like I say, this is, this, when you start studying this stuff, and you get an education, it, it, it just boils down to, if you keep it simple, stupid, uh, most people are not gonna get in an argument with you over this. Only people that really don't know it, but they'll get on the internet sometimes and they'll just, they'll, they'll parrot everything. And without, uh, they won't give you the dates. And when they quote the Latin, they'll quote Jerome's to try to prove uh, inconsistencies in our King James. And you have to ask them about the old Latin. And a lot of them won't know even there was an old Latin because in their schools, they're just giving them Latin's Jerome's. Just like you go over to get the, uh, uh, some manuscript evidence and you'll see how it was it, they were copied uh, the uh, the oldest but best manuscripts were copied by Westcott and Horton put out and that's what you do you see because it's the oldest you know the newest they don't they won't answer no questions that's just when you go to school that's just what you get so when you leave school you you make a determination on what you feel is the best English translation and most of them will go with the, you know, the Bible of the month. So they're moving away from NIV, they're getting to the standard uh, 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 English uh, version, and I don't know what's gonna be next, probably the international version or something. We had the new international, but I'm talking about like the coalition of churches or something. Because they're gonna get something that everybody agrees on. But you and I, we know the truth, it's gonna be hard pressed. And I'm just showing you that Catholic Church, every step of the way, caused a lot of destruction and tried to hide the truth, the real truth. And they always give you a semblance of truth. And they're always missing something. But if you don't have a final authority, you don't know what that something is. And that's that's the key. So after all these Latin things, bad, good, and ugly, uh, Erasmus gets on the scene. Uh, I am reading from Brother Sam Gibbs, and I'm taking liberty get this if, if you're into that the reintroductions of Texas Receptus readings in the 26th edition and uh, give them full credit for this so next step is inner Erasmus due to its wealth and ruthless persecution the Roman Catholic uh, had a virtual monopoly on academia in Europe in the sixth century. To be in that organization was to be accessible to education, scholarship, and vast libraries, not to mention wealth and opportunities for promotion. Anyone with an intellect within the Roman Catholic Church found a fast track to wealth and recognition. Anyone with an intellect outside of that organization found themselves in a catacomb, <laughs> flinching at every sound in the night. Parents, therefore, sought to establish their offspring within the security of the Roman Catholic organization in hopes of securing comfort for all concerned. What does that mean? <laughs> We're seeing that in our country with uh, vaccinations. That's what it means. Whether they believe it or not, if you're not doing it, they're for the government, whatever the government says. They're, they don't care. They're not questioning of that. They're, they want to have peace and comfort and, you know. But back in this days, this church would kill you. That's a big difference so far, so far. Maybe they're doing it with the vaccines, I don't know. So the, the father of uh, this, I'll just say, Deciderus Erasmus was a Roman Catholic priest. He was born in R Rotterdam in 1466 and died in 1536 at the age of 70. Obviously, uh, he was born out of wedlock. His parents both succumbed to the plague, leaving Erasmus and his brother in the care of his uncle, who promptly turned them over to the Roman Catholic Church to be drafted into the priesthood. And uh, parentless, he was raised 
in the uh, homey, uh, homey atmosphere of the Roman Catholic monastery. Destined against his will to be a Roman Catholic priest, Erasmus at least had a choice of what branch he would serve in. He chose to become an Aug Augustinian on the sole attribute that they were known to have the finest libraries available in Europe. This was where he could feed his insatiable desire for knowledge. Thus, unbeknownst to the Roman Catholic Church, it was supplying one of the greatest adversaries with the very ammunition he would use to devastate it. Ordained a priest in 1492, somebody, somebody in the boat did something there. Uh, it didn't take long before he was recognized as just a great problem to the Roman Catholic organization as he was a scholar. His behavior was somewhat bizarre by Augustinian standards. He refused to keep vigils, never hesitated to eat meat on Fridays, and uh, though ordained, chose uh, never to function as a priest. Uh, the Roman church had captured his body, but uh, quite apparently his mind and heart uh, were still unfettered. Young Erasmus became a student of the writings of Lorenzo Valla, Laurentius Valensas, 1407 to 1457. Vella was an energetic critic of the Roman Catholic Church. Born in Rome, he, like Erasmus later, was a humanist, meaning the desire to advance the cause of the common man against the church. This is not to be mistaken for humanists of the day who advance man as God against the Creator. Although one of the leading minds of his day, he preferred the language of the common man rather than that of his learned philosophical colleagues. So Vella was ever in conflict with the Roman authorities. He went too far uh, when he disputed the Roman Catholic claim that Apostles' Creed had indeed been written by the Apostles. He was arrested, tried, convicted by the Inquisition. Uh, only his position as well saved him from being burned as a heretic. Whew. And so, uh, trying to get to the, the point is this, Erasmus had the same ideas, did not buy into the Catholic tradition, and if you knew anything back then, if you ate meat on Friday, it was worse than a Jew. I mean, uh, you know, breaking things in front of everybody almost. I mean, they, they, they would take you, and if it was, this was during the Inquisition, you'd be tortured and killed. You'd be an enemy of the state. And so to have their priests, their intellects, eating meat on Friday and not doing these vigils and all this other kind of stuff, that's it's just an amazing thing that they lived as long as they did. And um, anyway, the Pope attempted to bribe Erasmus into silence by offering him a bishopric. The wealth and power of such a position as medieval Europe is unimaginable today. Erasmus rejected the bribe flat and continued his attacks undeterred. What do you mean? He got into the manuscripts, he saw the Catholic Church of what it was, and he produced like Luther did. And uh, so anyway, the coalition, uh, the gathering of the Greek New Testament, and uh, we'll get to that because I'm doing a whole lot in one thing. You're already probably, I don't want to tell you you're sleeping, but you could be sleeping. I need to get copies of this. You can, this is the same line, Antioch and Alexandrian, but it's got some comments on the sides. Um, all right. Now, most Bible scholars and theologians readily accept the doctrine of the divine and used to acknowledge the Bible doctrine of the divine preservation of the scriptures. Some argue that no such doctrine is taught in the scriptures at all. And uh, so we need to let the scriptures allow. What does that mean? That you got the word of God, God promised to preserve it. I don't think anybody in here believes otherwise, but go to the famous Psalms 12, 6, and 7. I say famous because it. Well, what does this mean? And then you get all sorts of answers for something so simple. Now, 
Now, could you imagine if somebody got saved? You know, you, you're trying to lead somebody to the Lord, and you brought up all this information ahead of time? You know, keep it simple, stupid, right? They got another sinner. We're in the gospel. You deliver that gospel. Some, God takes that gospel and uses it, but you got to deliver it, right? All right. And we preached on this whole chapter a few times, but 5 and 6 says, Psalms 12, right? Or I'm sorry, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Period. Those two verses tell you that God's obligated to preserve his word. And you can go into that, you can out and splice it, and there's a whole lot of information in those verses. And I told you before, it's it's amazing that there's smack dab in the middle of chaos that's going on on planet earth now go to uh, Psalm 100 Psalm 100 Psalm 100 and verse 5 Psalm 100 verse 5 says for the Lord is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth generations that's what it says Isaiah 40 verse 8 <clears throat> Isaiah 40 and verse 8 The word of our God will stand forever, forever. And then also Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and uh, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. And uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. So there are many other examples of the uh, divine doctrine of preservation in the scriptures but these are few we uh, refer to now preservation of the old testament text as with original inspiration of the scriptures where god used men to pen his exact words uh, supernatural providential preservation means that god again used men to preserve his exact words were written by moses and uh and the prophets and other men by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, the duty of preserving the written revelation from God was assigned to the priest of Israel. Now the priest were the divinely appointed guardians of the law. And uh, we know that in Deuteronomy, if you go to Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy 31 verses 24 to 26, Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 26, and it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished that Moses commanded the Levites which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord saying take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against thee. So the priests were also responsible for copying the scriptures. Yeah. What means were used to ensure the accurate transmission of the Old Testament text? Scribes, that's the writing priests. Wisdom to institute a fail-safe check and balance system in the copying and transcribing of the Old Testament scripture. For many centuries, these scribes were known as Meserets. The word Meseret means traditionalist. A Meseret's sole function was to preserve the integrity and purity of the traditional Old Testament text. 
Now, young men chosen to be Masoretes spent years in intense study and preparation for their lifelong task of faithfully copying the Word of God. And uh, just amazing thing. Um, for scribe means counter. And the Masoretes counted everything in the text. They knew, for example, that the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, contained 400,000 945 letters. They knew the Torah's middle word was the Hebrew word translated search in Leviticus 10.16. They knew the Torah's middle letter was in the Hebrew word translated belly in Leviticus 11.42. While such knowledge may seem trivial to us, the Mesorites knew such information was vital to their careful preservation of God's word. Now, were the uh, Mesorites successful in their attempt to accurately and fit the Old Testament scriptures over the generation? David Otis Fuller, editor of the book, Which Bible, made this statement. By the time of Christ, the Old Testament text was in, was in a settled condition. Since then, the Hebrew scriptures have been carried down intact well beyond the day of printing, A.D. 1456 through the unrivaled methods of the Jews in transmitting. Now this guy here, you can get his book too. Because David Otis Fuller quotes from him and he's an authority, I'm talking about authority. Uh, uh, Dr. Robert Dick Wilson, a biblical scholar who spoke 47 languages. He spent 45 years years he learned the biblical languages the next 15 years were spent studying the text of the Old Testament the last 15 years were given to compiling writing and teaching the results of his research he studied every consonant in the Hebrew Old Testament that's 1,250,000 according to Dr. Wilson's research his conclusion the evidence in our possession convinced me that at sundry times and in divers manners God spoke unto our fathers through the prophets and the Old Testament in Hebrew being immediately inspired by God has by his singular care and providence been kept pure in all ages. So how does this knowledge of the Jews faithful and accurate uh, handling of the Hebrew scriptures help us to understand uh, the divine presence of the King James Bible? The Mesorites continued their painstaking tedious process of producing exact copies of the Old Testament scriptures well beyond, well beyond uh, the day of printing. Uh, to cite Dr. Fuller, in fact, the Mesorites' methods for producing new scrolls was continued for about 300 years after the availability of printing. Up until the mid-18th century, given us a substantial number of scrolls and manuscripts from as late as 1750 A.D., and as early as A.D. 100. When these are examined and compared with the King James the preserved words of God in Hebrew, the Mesoraic text available to translators of the King James Bible in 1611 and available to us today became the preserved words of God in English in the King James Bible. And uh, like I say, I got a lot of books in my life it's just an amazing thing to see how what's the bottom line here the bottom line is this I believe I got God's word inspired preserved perfect and if they say well how did you get that don't you know men lying all this stuff so you forgot the verses I read earlier it's up to God it's up to God see you bring the God into it it's up to God to keep it what is it up to me to do believe it Faith comes by hearing him by the word of God. That's why it's important to give the gospel out. You know, not we use a bunch of our personalities and everything sometimes, and it's good. I mean, you're, you're who you are to lead people to the Lord or try to tell them about Jesus. And a lot of times we skip the power of the gospel. If, if the Bible in Romans 1 there, 120 or whatever it is, uh, tells us that the power is God's gospel and we don't give it to him, we're lacking his power. And we're discrediting what the Word of God said. That's why a lot of times things don't work out proper because we never really do it. We do it in piecemeal. 
man, go to the scriptures. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And just show them this is what God said. People have a mind. Holy Ghost knows how to work on it. Just something that we need to do. And now last week we covered the difference in the Bible readings. And uh, I believe this is part of it in regard to the exact number of editions. An edition in 1613 without the Apocrypha between the Testaments. An American edition in 1644 with a preface by a Baptist, John Cain. Uh, it was printed in Edinburgh in London in 1696, 1698, 1701, 1762, and 1766. There's an edition from Cambridge. And when you start understanding Oxford and Cambridge, two different places, put out manuscripts. Some had, had to correct their, their typos, and the other one had to be their typos. And when you get into all that, uh, people will say, well, that's revisions. No, it's not revisions. The way revisions are def defined. In addition, at Oxford, under uh, Dr. Blaney, 1767, where the Oxford copies were carefully collated with the f uh, folio edition of 1611, that of 1701 and two other editions. The edition was published finally at Clarendon, 1769. So yes, on your lap, 1769. This edition has been regarded as the standard copy for, for what? At least 200 and something years, because King James has been around 400, over 400. So in regards to variations, with the exception of typographical errors and changes required by the progress of Orthography, that's a study of correct use of words in the English language. Uh, the text of our present Bibles remains unchanged and without variations from the original copy as left by the translators. So the present copies of the Bible accord throughout with editions of 1611. Uh, and, uh, amen. I think, I think you've got the typo. You don't have that. This is probably what I'm going to copy and give you so you can see the, how things work. And if you remember, I think you got a copy of this too. That part. So you can see where the early churches were. Uh, get an ID, you can go to Revelation, where was it three, and get the seven churches. At least, you, and look up those areas. Look up your, uh, uh, you know, the areas of the churches, and then you can see where it's at locate on a map and then watch how it goes all the way to Germany France and everything how, it, how the word of God moves it's important to understand how God uses that and um, anyway we conclude that every uh, word in the Bible is inspired or God breathed 2 Timothy 3.16 states all scripture that's every word is given by inspiration of God now, we believe also in the plenary verbal inspiration of the Bible, uh, plenary meaning full and complete, critically careful to include minute details, verbal meaning that the very words of the Bible were given to the authors. The writers did not select the words, but instead selected to submit themselves to their God. So inspiration meaning the supernatural direction the authors enjoyed by and dwelled the Holy Ghost. We believe that the Bible is full and complete, that every word was given to the authors by God as they were supernaturally directed by the Holy Spirit, and that God has providentially preserved his words for us today. Now, the Bible does give witness to its inspiration. We find in the Old Testament alone more than 3,500 references that support inspiration. How? Anytime you come across and God said, who said it? God. You know, then you got uh, things like, uh, let's see, the word of God came saying, and then you also got the word of God or the word of the Lord came on to. So the prophets simply delivered the message they received from God. The prophets wrote what God told them as Peter testifies in 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 10 to 11 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you 
searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The prophets did not originate their message. The Bible is not a message from man, but to man by God. Now this next paragraph is amazing to me. Over 40 different men wrote over a 1500 period for the vast majority of these men, they never were able to discuss with each other their writings. In light of this, we see that it was necessary for the Holy Spirit to guide and guard so that the message would be perfect and true. If the Holy Spirit was able to guide and guard the word for a period of 1500 years, is he not able to guide and guard onto his present day to keep his word perfect and true? Resounding answers, yes. And uh, we look into the well, we'll look into the question of preservation uh, again. But uh, the one great theme of the Bible, Jesus Christ, attests to its inspiration. We see uh, this theme portrayed in the Old Testament as Jesus is coming, in the New Testament as Jesus has come and is coming again. When we speak of inspiration, we refer to the writings and not men. The inspiration is in the Word of God. The words that were written were inspired. The authors were not always and everywhere inspired. As men, they were fallible, but this was never transmitted to the Scriptures. God is able to keep human error out of His Word both then and now. With God, all things are possible. Matthew 19.26 says, Each man yielded himself entirely to the will of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, what was produced was inspired. Since each word is God-breathed, man is not to add or take away from scriptures. God gives us three warnings in reference to this. We find these warnings at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the Bible. This here even scares me. <laughs> I'm safe and secure. Deuteronomy 4.2 you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Add thou not unto his word, approve thee, and thou be found a liar. Revelations 22, 19. And if a man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city <laughs> and from things which were written in the book. As John states in John 10, 35, the scripture cannot be broken. Men are not to tamper with the Bible, for the Bible is God's word. When you got Mesoraics and you got these other men that are handling the word of God that, that God chose, when you look at the translators, we eventually look at them, the intelligence that they had, the respect they had, uh, the reverence they had for God and his word, man, they were scared to death to mess with this stuff. And they had a system to go over and over and over to make sure that they translated it correctly. All these things, uh, when you handle the word of God, it's just like us. You don't want to handle it deceitfully. And you don't want to use it for gain. It's the word of God. Now, we also know that the word of God is inspired. Each book is a personal message to us and shows us God's salvation plan through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And uh, the majority of religious scholars and people of today would accept the divine inspiration of the originals. Where we differ with the religious world is that we hold that God not only gave us his inspired word in the originals, but that he has preserved them for us today in copies reaching back to the originals. What does that mean? My King James is inspired and preserved. So our lesson is uh, the foundation of preservation and uh, we'll get into more detail uh, about that. I found this booklet here in my library from Dr. George T. Crabb. He uh, used to go to Antioch Baptist in Warren back when I was in school. And uh, I believe he's Reformers Anonymous. Uh, he's a real doctor, a medical doctor. And uh, he did a good, good thing. And Dr. Grady actually started the ball working with his authority of the word. When he come out with his book on that, Everybody in the information that I have, quote him. So today, preacher, what did we learn besides me? <laughs> well, most of the time it's the educated ones that are adding doubt and not faith. 
and you got to be aware of that. And you can get the same material I have. You can do the same kind of study. You can go probably YouTube anything, and you'll see the difference between the the uh, Alexandrian cult and us. Big difference. And uh, you call it a cult, yeah, because they they could care less actually about the Word of God. It's their expertise in in finding the real, true Word of God for you. Once again, if you follow that line of thinking, I don't know how you can grab your Bible and say this is the very Word of God and believe it, believe it, because you're, you're saying that somehow intelligence and what's the closest to somebody that's intelligence, heart, as the Word of God you're buying into. This book hasn't talked to you. And that's all part of the spirit world. That's, that's your supernatural birth, a supernatural book. Things ought to get together to where you know this is the Word of God. It ought to show you it's the Word of God. That's the way I believe it, not just a book of words. And one of the greatest qualities of this, this book here, it's against us. And it also is a book that puts the mistakes of the heroes in it. God didn't shorten nothing. So, it's our manual. Amen.